We need some cross trainers for the video. Oh, nope, wrong closet. Hmm. Bathroom, nope. Ah, here we are. Shoes. Let's go with a Nano 10. JJ4 Metcon 6. Ooh. And the Apex 2. Let's go dive into it. What's going on guys? Today we're talking training shoes and more importantly, different parts of a training shoe because I think when you watch reviews and so forth on different shoes that you might be interested in, understanding the different parts of the shoe and how they're made is really important to helping you not only getting the best choice for your needs, but to buy a shoe that is gonna be both durable and high performing for you. So in this video, we're gonna talk about, I think seven to eight characteristics of each training shoe that is nice to know and just understand a baseline level of Let's dive into the first aspect, which is the outsole. So the outsole of a training shoe is this outer rubber layer here. Generally, you'll see outsoles wrap up and around the midfoot, toe, and heel. And why is the outsole important? Well, for starters, it's pretty much your tread and support for every training shoe. So if you look at these four different options here, there's a lot of different outsole constructions, and each of them tell a different story. So let's look at the Reebok Nano 10 over here, right? So we have that split outsole. It's relatively flat, consistent grip. This suggests that this shoe is gonna be pretty dang stable and flat under weight. If we look at the JJ4, it has more of like an athletic build. So we have a toe box here that is made to be a little bit more reactive and grippy for propulsion and different running activities, jumps and so forth. And then as we make our way through the midfoot, it gets a little bit more narrow. And then in the outsole back here towards the heel, there's a little gap here for the heel to give a little bit of reactivity for athletic facing movements, but then we have some outer outsole support on the outside. So this would suggest that this style of shoe is gonna be really good for more of your athlete that needs it for running, jumping, maybe some light lifting and so forth. Looking at the Under Armour Hover Apex 2, we have an outsole that's pretty split up. We have that proprietary tri-base material here and then towards the heel, pretty stable. And then up here on the toe, we have some split throughout the metatarsal. So it's gonna be giving a little bit of reactivity and so forth. What this would suggest to me is that this shoe is designed to be similar to the more athlete facing shoe, but still provide a little bit of stability. And you can see that through the tri base here, how it is a little bit more flat and a little bit more stable when it comes to just providing you a bigger base. Looking at the Metcon 6, outsole, like the Nano 10, relatively consistently flat throughout. There's not any splits here. There is a little bit of a rigid material up here towards the toe. That's for comfort reactivity, but Looking at this kind of outsole compared to these, you can see that this is designed to be a lot more flat and stable, which would suggest it's gonna be a much more stable option, which we know it is. So if you look at the different outsoles and different training shoes, they kind of tell a different story as to what type of activity they could be best for. The next characteristic we're gonna discuss is the midsole. So the midsole is this spongy little layer here that sits in between the outer portion of the shoe and the outsole. Now. What do we need to know about midsoles? Well, for starters, a midsole is gonna be providing the majority of your base and reactivity when it comes to lifting, heel strike, and everything in between. So when you're jumping and so forth, the midsole is gonna pretty much dictate how that shoe is gonna feel and perform. Now, if we look at some of the different options here, so look at the Nano 10, how we have that TPU layer that comes up over the midsole, this would suggest that this is gonna be a much more stable option. But then we do have a little bit of an like outward facing, generally the midsole is gonna be like a foam material right here, and that suggests that there's gonna be a little bit of reactivity up here on the toe, but it's gonna be stable throughout. Looking at the JJ4, which we know is a more athletic facing shoe and designed for athletes, the midsole is a little bit more consistent throughout. We have this, again, like a high density EVA foam, what it feels like, and it's all throughout the forefoot, midfoot, and heel. That is to provide you with a little bit more reactiveness. This shoe is gonna be a little bit more easy on landing, running, and so forth because it is designed to have a little bit of give to it when it comes to the midsole construction. Looking at the Metcon 6, as you can see, not a lot of midsole going on here. And again, that suggests how stable this shoe is and what it's designed to do. It's designed to provide you with a maximum traction on the ground and to not compress under certain, certain weights. So having no midsole here is a good suggestion that the Metcon 6 is stable AF. Looking at the Hover Apex 2, we have a lot of midsole going on here. And now why we're diving into the midsole now is because it's gonna lead us to our next point, which is the heel to toe offset. 
But looking at the mid midsole in this shoe, it's pretty thick throughout, which suggests that it's going to have a lot of reactiveness throughout, despite being designed for both lifting and more athletic facing movements. So the midsole is this inner layer here that sits in between the outsole and the outer or insole of the shoe. And it is this layer that's gonna provide that shoe with its comfort, stability, and reactivity. Now let's talk about the third characteristic. So the drop or the heel to toe offset in a training shoe is the height that it has between the heel and the forefoot. So when you're looking at cross trainers and different training shoes, they all will have a different heel to toe offset or drop to them. What does that mean? So when it comes to providing your foot with a more stable flat base, you'll have options like the Nano 10, the Metcon 6. These have about a four millimeter heel to toe offset. That means this shoe is gonna be pretty stinking flat on the ground. Now, when we look at options like the Hover Apex 2, we can see that the heel sits a little bit higher than the toe. There's a lot more material going on throughout, and this is about an eight millimeter heel to toe offset. Now for athletes and so forth that do need to be a little bit more on their toes when it comes to their style of activity and performance, it makes sense to have a slightly higher heel to toe offset. Now, generally speaking, a higher heel to toe offset, so let's say like eight millimeters or higher, will generally be better for folks who need heel strike first in their movements, so folks who are doing a little bit more running and so forth. Then the lower heel to toe offset will be for folks who want the forefoot to hit first. Why is this important to understand? Well, when it comes to what the shoes are designed to do, if you do plan on running a lot, obviously you want a little bit more cushion under the heel. Generally, higher heel to toe offsets will have more cushion as pretty evident by these two examples in this video, then lower shoes will have less material. Now, that's important because when you are doing like cross training and so forth, and you're doing shorter runs, jumps, and lifting, obviously you don't need a lot of material under that heel because if you are jumping, you're gonna want that forefoot to hit first. So having a ton of material back here in the heel might lead to some instability and so forth. But again, that's gonna be a case by case and performance need basis. But that's generally what those two will suggest when it comes to being high and low with a heel to toe offset. Now let's quickly go over what a shank is in the shoe. So the shank is gonna be this midfoot structure that separates the toe from the heel. It's basically what provides the midfoot with support and then it still allows that toe to move freely and be reactive. So in the tri-base rain, for example, I think they have the best example in all these shoes as to what the shank actually is. This material here in this structure would be technically called the shank and it pretty much allows this toe to still bend while providing that midfoot with some support. In the JJ4, for example, you can see the shank here is this more closed layer of material, provides a little bit of support for that midfoot, but then still allows that toe to move pretty freely. So when looking at the shank of a shoe, understand that it's designed to support the midfoot of the shoe, but then keep the toe still reactive. If a shoe has a minimalist shank or non, no shank at all, it's probably not gonna be the best for lifting because obviously you want that foot to be supported when you are compressing and training and putting weight onto your body under the shoe because you don't want that foot to collapse. So having a shank is important when it comes to a cross training shoe. How much you need will be dictated on what you're trying to do in the shoe. Now it is worth noting that minimalist shoes and more of like our like racing focused running shoes, you'll see less of a shank in because we do not want the midfoot to be over encumbered with material. But generally these trainers will have some form of shank included in them to provide the midfoot with additional strength and support. Another important component to consider is the toe box. The toe box is the, toe box is the area up here where the toes sit and wiggle around and move. And obviously that matters a lot for lifting and cross training purposes. Why? Well, when we look at shoes like the Nano 10 that do have a slightly wider toe box, that suggests that you're gonna have room in this shoe to splay those toes out when you're lifting and really grip the floor. In the JJ4, for example, we can see the toe box is a little bit more narrow. Now, that doesn't mean that the JJ4 is not as great as the Nano 10, it just means that depending on how your foot is built and how you like the shoe to fit, it will help dictate what kind of toe box you need. If you want more room to splay those toes, then going for a slightly wider fitting shoe will be a better bet for you. The next component we're gonna look at is the outer construction. So every shoe will have its own proprietary means of an outer construction, and the outer construction will play a big hand in breathability, durability, and just overall fit and feel. So if we look at the Metcon 6 here, we have like a mesh, you can see my fingers through it. This suggests that it's gonna be very breathable. 
Now we can look at some of the more intricacies of this outsole and outer construction, sorry, outer construction, and we can see that we have like a synthetic leather up here, or like this like more like TPU layer, and that's a good suggestion of durability. Then we can look at like the Nano 10, has that flex weave material, which is breathable. It's gonna be pretty durable to abrasion. Looking at the JJ4 here, pretty dang breathable. It's got like a synthetic mesh-like material. Then we have like a thicker material over here on the toe. Again, great sign for durability. Then looking at the Under Armour shoe, we have like more of like a rubber slash TPU texture that encloses the full shoe. I'm guessing that's for durability. And then we have like a mesh up here on the toe for breathability. So looking at a shoe's outer construction, it can tell you what type of features this shoe is gonna have. If you have a more opened mesh material, it's gonna suggest more breathability. When we have layered materials like these, it's gonna suggest durability because it means that we are layering certain areas of the shoe that are usually getting a lot of friction and so forth. So that's why you'll see these toes have extra layers because when you're toe dragging, we want that outer to last and we don't want a lot of friction causing fraying. Now let's talk about the tongue and the shoelaces and eyelets. So the tongue is really important because a thicker tongue will one, be a little bit better from a durability purpose and standpoint, but also a smaller tongue can get roped in or like kind of get sucked into the shoe when you're doing different activities. So having a tongue that is a little bit thicker and full encompassing of the full foot that lays a little bit more flat will generally be better. Now, it is a personal level of preference of how much tongue you actually like. For example, in the Hover Apex 2, there's a lot of tongue. I don't know if I necessarily like this much tongue, but it is kind of nice to have because this tongue very rarely does get sucked into the side like this and so forth. Now, when it comes to the eyelets of the shoe, generally speaking, they're gonna be a very good suggestion of the midfoot durability of the shoe. So when you have eyelets like this that are on the inside layer of the outer, similar here, or we have things like the Flywire and the Metcon 6, those eyelets, are usually gonna be both one supportive, but also pretty dang durable because we have that shoe tech one kind of hiding these laces from outer materials. But then also we have like the additional flywire support and the Nike, which is gonna be both supportive and a little bit more durable than just your conventional eyelet where it's just gonna be sitting by itself. It has basically like a double little layer of protection here. Now, how many eyelets you would want on a shoe? really comes down to your personal preference. Generally, if you like the shoe to fit a little bit higher on the ankle, you're gonna look for more eyelets that come back. So if we look at the Under Armour shoe and the Nike Metcon right here, we can see that the eyelets stop a little bit more short on the midfoot in this model. So we do have a little bit more of a, like an ankle spot here for or basically a little bit more room for the ankle to live and breathe versus on the Metcon 6 where it does come up a little bit higher. And we even have another eyelet back here for lace locking. So if you really want that shoe to be supported on the foot and really tight, you can do that in the Metcon 6. But how many eyelets and what are best really come down to your preferences and needs. Look at the shoe you have now. And if you like how that fits, then look for other models that are similar in nature because my guess is, is that what you have is probably working pretty dang well for you. All right, now bringing it to the heel of the shoe. So here we have the heel collar, which is this material here that wraps around the heel. And then this pointed port right here is our heel tap. This is designed to protect the Achilles and provide that shoe with that nice, stable feeling to prevent any form of heel slip. Now, when it comes to what you prefer, it's gonna be often dictated on how secure you want that heel to feel. Generally, a lower heel tab will be a little bit more mobile on the shoe. That doesn't mean it's gonna slip necessarily, but you're not gonna have that extra layer of support that's really hugging in that heel. That's oftentimes why the Metcon's first models often had a little bit of heel slip. They had a very low heel tab and so forth, which caused the heel to pop out at times. Now, what's best, what's worst, it really comes down again to how you want that shoe to fit and feel. As long as I think that shoe is supportive in the heel and the shoe's heel isn't like giving immediately right upon first couple uses and it doesn't slip off the foot, then I think every form of heel construction does have some benefit. Really comes down to your wants and needs. The final aspect we're gonna talk about is the last of the shoe. This is basically like the 3D model that companies make the shoes to fit for. There are a bunch of different types of lasts out there. Now, they are gonna vary a lot. So as you can see, like this last by the Reebok JJ4 is much different than what's used in the Under Armour Hover Apex 2. This last is designed to be a little bit more of like a straight last, a little bit wider, while this is like more of like our semi or C-shaped last. Now, what's best is gonna be dictated for what you need the shoe for. Generally speaking, cross-training shoes will have 
I like more hybrid last that's gonna be very stable in nature and straight, but also have a little bit of give to it when it comes to just how it's gonna fit athletically and perform. So when looking at different shoes and how they're gonna fit and feel, look and consider the last. A wider last is gonna be better for wider footed individuals who need a little bit more help when it comes to like midfoot support and so forth and wiggle room. And then more of your, like your C-shaped or semi C-shaped are gonna be better for your like hybrid athletes who want a more like racing style focus shoe, maybe one that's better for running and so forth. That's the last aspect I would say consider for your training shoe. When it comes to cross trainers specifically and their last, if you have any questions, always drop them down below. I've reviewed <laughs> nearly every cross trainer at this point, so shout them out below and I'll answer to the best of my abilities based on how I think they'll fit for you off of what you wear now. All right. Thanks for making it this long, you training shoe nerds. Hopefully you've learned something in this video when you are searching for your next cross trainer that you can apply to making the best educated choice for your needs and wants. If you have any more questions for me, drop them down below. And as always, drop the video a like, drop the channel, subscribe, helps motivate me. I'll see you guys in the next one.